Howdy! Have you ever wanted me to run a one-shot for you and up to four of your friends? If not, you can skip to this timecode. But if so, then I have great news for you. Right now, I am hosting a raffle to give away one free up to five hour long one shot adventure for the winner and up to four friends in a digital Pathfinder 2 e-game hosted by yours truly. Between now and July 1st, any donations made using the link in the description, my stream elements tip page, will be entering you into a raffle. For every two US dollars your donation is, you will get your name entered that many times into the raffle. Four dollars, you get two entries. Twenty dollars, you get ten entries. At the end of the month, I will be recording myself with every single name on a big wheel for every single entry and spinning that wheel to show off the winner of the raffle. I'll work with the winner to set up a date, time, and VTT platform for the virtual one-shot to be played. So, if this sounds interesting to you, the link is in the description to my tip page. Every $2 donated gets you a name in. Anybody can win this. One name is all it takes if the wheel happens to land on you. You can obviously donate more if you want to increase your odds. And I thought about just doing a normal auction, but I didn't like the idea that the richest person won. So, I like the raffle idea. You can throw $2 in, and you might win. You never know, and all the money goes to support me, keeping a roof over my head, and helping fund the channel going forward. As a final little caveat, every single active Known At Ones patron is getting two free entries right into the raffle, whether you're a patron now, or you become a patron in the next week before the end of this competition, you will get your name entered twice into the raffle. So if you want to support the channel, this is an amazing way to do that. Thank you so much, on to the video. Howdy, my name is Known At. And I'm going to start this video off with a story. You've already seen what the title and what the video is about, but I still want to start it this way because I think it adds dramatic flair. I was playing in a Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 campaign about seven years ago now, and we came across a door. A wooden door in the middle of a goblin cave. We were there to find and defeat these goblins, but there was a door. There was no other passages, we just had to make it through this locked wooden door. So what do we do? Well, we try to pick the lock, and each of us who can fails. So the fighter, geniusly, tries making an attack roll to stick their spear in the lock, and they nat one and break the head of their spear off in the lock. And we try as much as we can. We try athletics checks, we try different ways to get the door open, but because we keep failing, we're stuck at this door. And it leads to one of the most iconic moments of my entire tabletop role-playing career where we decide it's a wooden door we'll burn it in this cave with no airflow so we light it on fire the smoke fills the room and we leave the cave for like three in-game hours while the smoke just billows out of this cave on uh, the upside we got through the door and on the bonus upside all the goblins asphyxiated from the smoke but what is the point of this story? Why do I bring this up at the beginning of a video about the success spectrum in tabletop role-playing games? Well, because we spent a long time at that door. In fact, I believe we spent over one hour of our session trying to figure out new ways to mechanically open this door because all of the official ways we had tried had failed. Now, I'm sure you've heard this specific phrase before, but just in case you haven't, I want to reiterate it. There is something called failing forward, and that is going to be super relevant to what we're talking about here today. Because today, I am telling you about what I have lovingly dubbed the success spectrum, and how this can help you avoid those really weird dead ends in your game. We've all been there where everyone failed their checks and you can't progress the story unless someone succeeded, but you also can't try the check again. So the GM ends up doing something like saying, okay, so you all failed, but uh, the, this happens. And it just has to completely improvise how you move forward even after everybody has failed. Before we get any farther, I do want to thank all of my patrons on the Known At Ones Patreon page for helping support me and this channel. Remember, if you want to support the channel as well, for $10 a month, you can use the link in the description to get your name on that list with all those amazing people. And until the end of the month of June 2024, all patrons will get two entries into the raffle mentioned at the beginning of this video. Thank you so much for all of your support. Hey, Travis, I didn't close you. Did you crash? Give me back my notes! 
Recover, please. 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 No. No, I lost all my notes. Damn it. So let's just start right off with it. What is the success spectrum? Well, if you play games by the books like D&D and Pathfinder, then success and failure are very black and white. There is a target number. If you hit that number or higher, you succeed and do what you tried to do. If you hit any lower than that number, you don't do what you tried to do. You tried to pick the lock, DC 15. You rolled a 16, you pick the lock. You rolled a 14, you don't pick the lock and fail. From a purely mechanical standpoint, there is nothing wrong with this system. If you're looking at games as a skeleton of math and randomness, that is all you need to write. But we don't think too hard about the random little dead ends this can lead us to. Everybody failed their check to pick the lock. So what now? The pre-made adventure doesn't have any other ways through, potentially, and maybe you weren't ready for them to fail. Maybe it was a low-level DC lock check, but they just happened to roll a 2 on the die and failed. What now? Well, for me as a GM, I don't tend to run into these dead ends too often because I use the success spectrum. So what does that mean? I keep throwing this word around. Well, let's use an example. There is a locked door, and it's a DC 15 check to unlock the door. The rogue rolls a total of 13. They have failed. But I as the GM know, uh-oh, if this door doesn't open? I don't know how they progress through this dungeon and thus the story. So, they succeed. But, that is the most useful term you can give yourself as a game master running a campaign. You succeed, but. I can't tell you the number of checks that I've let my pa party succeed at, even though they missed the DC by, you know, one, two, or three points. But when that happens, I always give a consequence. DC numbers are not set in stone, and I think looking at them as this number wins, any lower loses, is not a healthy way to tell a story. Rather, you should look at each increasing number as their skill in that moment. A 5 is not as good as a 10, is not as good as a 15. But even if the DC is 20, that 15 should still be worth more than the 5. So, if they underroll that check a little bit, maybe they do unlock the door, but they've damaged their thieves' tools. They're still a little more useful, but for the rest of this session, or until they can sit down and repair them, they take a minus two penalty to all future pick lock checks. Simple things like that. Obviously, this is not going to be easy for everybody, especially new GMs. New GMs can struggle with improvising penalties and consequences like that. But the sooner you get started practicing with the success spectrum, the more fun you can have with it, and the more you can lean into failing forward, even to the point where if someone makes a check and they miss the DC by a wide margin in what Pathfinder 2e would consider a critical failure, you can still make it so they fail and the story progresses, albeit in a more negative direction. A game that does this amazing is City of Mist. In City of Mist, the target number is always seven or higher. Seven to nine is a success with consequences. That is what I see a normal failure look like in Pathfinder in D&D. You missed that target number by two to four points, you're still gonna succeed, but here's something that goes wrong for you. And don't be afraid of limiting this just to roleplay. If you have a character who, unfortunately, just because the dice didn't like them, had a really bad turn and didn't get to do anything, maybe the wizard cast a ignition spell and just missed the target's armor class by one or two, have some fun with it. You're the GM, you run this world. Maybe they miss their mark, but it still licks the enemy as the fireball goes past them, so they take, like, two points of fire damage. Just little things like that can make a missed turn suddenly feel a lot less bad. Obviously, you can't do this for every dice roll, especially in combat. You can't just make it so every missed attack suddenly also deals a little bit of chip damage. That wouldn't be worth anything. But occasionally, as a GM, even in rolls that don't typically use it, 
breaking out the success spectrum can make your combat and world feel so much more alive and realistic because in real life, success and failure is not black and white. You don't just succeed or fail at anything you do. You succeed at various degrees. You fail in various degrees. I haven't even talked about the other direction of this, where if I have a DC 18 check and somebody rolls a 33, then I love to describe how even if there's no critical success result for what they're doing, they go above and beyond or they get flashy with it for no reason. You know, if you tumble through a target and you destroy their reflex save with your acrobatics check, maybe you do a full like triple sow cow backflip over them just because your character can because they're that skilled and like to show off a little bit. Have fun with it. Let the die result be your inspiration as a GM to describe the outcome. Or if they crush it well enough, put that pressure on your players. Say, hey, you crushed this. Describe how you do this with ease. Giving your players the ability to define their own success spectrum based on how you tell them they did can be a lot of fun. A lot of GMs are afraid of giving up that creative control, but trust me, once you start asking your players exactly how they do things, they will get a lot more immersed as well, and you'll get plenty more to play with. Now, obviously, this is going to be difficult, especially for new GMs. And I'm not telling you to have a different success result for every single possible number the player can roll. What I am saying is, during important checks especially, maybe get a little bit creative with how many different outcomes there can be. And you'll find the more you do it, the more creative you can be and the easier it gets to pull these different results, to pull these different penalties and circumstances out of nowhere to apply to players. You know, in that same vein, that failed pick lock check, you know, maybe they did pick it, but they also sort of twisted their wrist wrong when they did it, and now they have the clumsy one condition for an hour. The more you know the conditions and other special mechanics of the game system you're running, the more fun you can have. Inflict conditions on failures, change the scenario slightly based on how well they succeeded or how much they failed. Just, if you can, try to avoid any role that is just, you failed, so you can't. Because at the end of the day, unless that is the design of the check, it's boring. Even a grandiose failure should never be, no, sorry, you can't do that. Now, I say this, and of course, I do that. It's very easy to fall into that, especially for checks that you aren't super prepared for. I'm not saying you need to be this perfect improvisation master, because nobody is. There is no DM or GM out there who is ready to improvise and react to every single possible thing your players can do. But you'd be surprised how much a little bit of practice can go. That was not a sentence that made any grammatic sense. At the end of the day, this is an optional rule. If you and your party are perfectly happy with the black and white success fail system, more power to you. This is just a piece of advice from my experience on how to avoid potential dead ends where everybody has tried something and everybody either got unlucky or wasn't good enough to do it. The success spectrum can really open up the possibilities of your game and make things a little bit more immersive. So let me know in the comments if you use the success spectrum yourself or if after watching this video you try it out. I want to hear how it goes for you. Thank you so much to all of my patrons again and to all of you for leaving a like on the video and subscribing to the channel. This was my fifth video this week of our first five video week and I am so excited to see what next week is going to look like. So strap in. I gotta get to work on next week's videos. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time, no nat ones.